Just a quick announcement. As a courtesy to others, please silence silence your cell phones. Thank you very much. anyone qualified to put, put the Adler School's recent history into perspective is Dr. Harold Mosek. He has taught at the school since it was founded in 1952. Dr. Mosek is widely regarded as an expert on Adlerian psycho psychology. Having helped launch the, launch the Adler School with Dr. Bernard Schumann and Dr. Rudolf Dreikers, uh, Pete, uh, they're one of the Alfred Adler's closest co colleagues. This morning, Dr. Mozak will discuss tactics in sex therapy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Harold Mozak. something. You Minnesotans have short memories. <laughs> to be introduced three times. <laughs> this is my tactics notebook. Every time I think of a tactic, I write it down so that when I get into situations like this, I can choose which of them. I imagine I have several hundred in here by now which of these I'm going to talk about. And as I said last night, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to cover all the things I would like to cover. But we'll give you some idea of the kinds of things that are available. But before we start talking about tactics today, I want to answer the question that you raised last night. What do you do if a patient invites you to her, or his wedding or some similar kind of event? Uh, I don't know what you do. Uh, I know what I do, but uh, other therapists do other things. Some people feel that you should not attend any of these events. Some on the basis of so-called dual relationship. You cannot be uh, a social friend, as it were, at the same time that you're the person's therapist. Uh, for others, it has nothing to do with uh, ethics. It's just that it impedes therapy. It leads the therapist to feel uncomfortable many times, and it sometimes leads the patient to be uncomfortable because the patient gets a no. And uh, if you don't ask, then you'll never be rejected. Uh, so uh, some people uh, uh, don't ask and they don't get rejected, but they still want the therapist to be there because sometimes the therapist is even help the patient get married. Uh, I had a crazy thing happening uh, about uh, 30 years ago. Uh, a man and a woman met in my group therapy. And uh, after a year of acquaintanceship, et cetera, they decided they were for each other. And uh, they decided to get married. And they thought that the only place to get married was in my office. 
<laughs> it was so meaningful to them. So uh, I had to debate what was I going to do about this. <laughs> and I decided uh, yeah, I would uh, permit it. So I shut down my office for the afternoon. And uh, they came with their families. And uh, uh, his brother was a minister, so they kept it all in the family. And uh, they got married there, and then they took off her uh, post-wedding meal and that kind of thing. So uh, you said uh, something like this is happening yeah. to me right now. Uh, over a career, it's happened to me in one way or another, maybe a hundred times. So some people do it on the basis of, make their decision on the basis of theory. The Freudians, and those who subscribe to that kind of thinking, feel that it interferes or damages the transfers. So uh, I read a letter in a psychiatric journal a psychiatrist was treating uh, a patient regularly, and the patient came down with something he hemorrhaged or whatever. And they took him to the hospital, and for some reason they couldn't reach his uh, physician. So they called his therapist, who was also an MD, who came and treated him. And now he asked the editors of the journal, should he continue seeing that patient? Because now he had done something medical and therefore indicated that his psychotherapy was medical and to change the whole direction of the therapy as far as he was concerned and uh, raise questions about Freudian transference and that kind of thing. And he and the editors decided that it was bad business to continue with the therapy, even though he felt good about saving his patient's life. He could not, and he had affirmation from the editors that uh, he should not proceed with the psychotherapy of the patient. So some people do that kind of thinking, that in one way or another it damages the therapy, and you should not do it. Others feel just the opposite. They feel, after all, you participate in a meaningful way in the patient's life. Why shouldn't you? It's another meaningful event in the patient's life. And therefore, <coughs> if the patient for any reason feels it's important to have you there, then you're letting him down by not being there. See. And it might even be taken as a sign that you don't even approve of this marriage. If you really approved, you'd come, you'd be there. So your mere absence may create this kind of feeling on the part of the patient. So you find people on both sides uh, of this question, and people take different stances. I personally do not go, but I talk about it. It's not a mere no, and I explain to the patient why I can't go. Sometimes I do it on an ethical basis. I feel that I should not be there ethically because it would create the feeling in the patient that we're not only therapist and client, but we're also good friends. But in addition to that, it might give the community some ideas. Somebody at the wedding might know me and spread the word, oh, he must be in therapy because Dr. Mozak is there. 
So in that sense, unwittingly, I would be, be betraying the patient's confidence. I'd be letting the world know, even though I have no intention of doing that, that I'm a therapist and I'm probably the patient's, uh, one of them uh, is my patient. In addition to that, it leaves me uncomfortable. For one thing, I don't know anybody there. So basically, the only advantage I have, if it's an advantage, is I get a good meal, but other than that, <laughs> at such an event, I'm socially isolated. Uh, by accident, I may know somebody there, but I don't really know anybody there. But then there are the inevitable questions. Are you on the bright side? Are the groom side? Uh, how do you know so-and-so uh, and all of that? Which I feel uncomfortable answering. But to say uh, I'm a friend puts me in a position of really lying, although I can justify it or rationalize it as a therapist, I'm his friend too. You know, so it isn't a total lie, but I feel uncomfortable with it because it is a, a deception. So on practical grounds, rather than theoretical grounds and that kind of thing, uh, I don't go. And I discuss it with the patient why I can't go, and uh, usually is accepted, uh, perhaps reluctantly. They would really like me there, but they understand that uh, for the reasons I've stated, I can't attend. But as I say, there are people who believe quite differently. Okay, that takes care of the question from last night and we'll start talking about tactics. Tactics answer the question of what do you do when your patient, whatever. Mm -hmm. It is not a long-range strategy. A tactic is designed to get you past a certain point. And the point is Sometimes resistance, as I described last night, nothing's going to happen unless you get them past this point. And sometimes it's just a matter of you do it because it will move the therapy along, not because there's any, thera uh, any uh, therapeutic resistance, but it will, if you solve this problem, move the therapy along. Now, the first group of things I'd like to talk with you about this morning, and I won't be able to cover all these notes that I have written down, are differential diagnosis techniques. Sometimes it is important to know whether the symptoms of the patient describes are psychological or non-psychological. You will find in the literature it says whether it is psychological or physiological or biological or some such thing like that. I used to say that myself except I ran into a situation where it was psychological and non-psychological. It was not psychological and somatic, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But at any rate, if the person's symptoms are physiological, you're not in a position to treat them. And if you make an error and treat something as psychological, which is somatic, the patient may be a, become a psychologically healthy corpse. <laughs> so uh, 
I was impressed and frightened as a, as a student and as an intern by the story of George Gershwin. Gershwin, at a very, very early age, began to experience headaches and his well-intentioned friends, because the rage at that time was everybody could use a little bit of psychoanalysis, prevailed upon him to seek psychoanalysis. And he went to see one of the most famous psychoanalysts in the United States, perhaps even in the world. And the, psychologist, the psychiatrist treated him psychologically for these headaches. And Gershwin died of a brain tumor. And other psychiatrists sort of consoled the psychiatrist and said, you know, anybody can miss a diagnosis and that kind of thing. Uh, Unfortunately, you committed an error, but you're human. And my thought was, if I become a psychotherapist, then the law, at least, and the psychiatry group would not be as kindly disposed to me as they were to the psychiatrist. They would feel, what the hell is a psychologist doing treating people because, you know, you people all decided to practice counseling or psychotherapy or some such thing like that. And in doing that, you behave like my kids did when they were young. They would come to me and say, Dad, what kinds of TV programs did you watch when you were a kid? <laughs> Well, when I was a kid, there were no TV programs or TVs for that matter. It seemed incomprehensible that you could, well, Adam and Eve had a set. <laughs> so, this was the state of psychotherapy at the time. In fact, when I joined Dr. Dreckers in practice, the first thing the state of Illinois did was char charge me legally with practicing medicine without a license. And for a year or so, we had to fight this. And finally, I established the right for psychologists in the state of Illinois to practice psychotherapy. So I'm talking about a period when people just, psychologists didn't do that kind of thing. And consequently, if I missed, if George Gershwin were my patient, I'd be in big trouble. So I decided to spend a year on neurology ward, seeing the kinds of patients who might give me that kind of trouble. So it became a problem of differentiating which is which, and I didn't know which is which unless it was rather obvious. If a person had epilepsy and had a fit, well, obviously he had epilepsy. Even then, there were hysterical epilepsies which were psychological. And it was not until I joined Dreikers in practice that I learned to differentiate. The technique is called the question, capital T, capital Q in print. It's not just any question. And it was devised by Adler. And we asked patients, if I were to use my golden wand or a magic uh, pill or some such thing like that, depending on who your patient is, and it got rid of this symptom or these symptoms forever, they'd never return, what would be different in your life? 
if the person comes up with an answer like, I wouldn't have this pain, I wouldn't go to bed crying every night because my head hurt or whatever, then it is very likely non-psychological. If the person says, I'd write that book that I've always been meaning to write, then it very likely is psychological. And one of my students, one of the first graduates of our school in Chicago, decided to find out if that was true. So he did his doctoral dissertation on it. And in 92% of the cases he examined, he guessed right. So the test is, or the technique, is a rather useful technique. So, I was in practice with Dreikers maybe a week when together we saw a woman who and cried all over the place and as she told her story, I, being basically a year or two out of my internship, thought to myself, boy, here's a classic hysteric. She was married to a syndicate killer. And she didn't like him, so she told him she wanted a divorce. So he took a pistol and put it to her head and said, Honey, that's the only divorce you're getting. She started a nursery school, and within two or three weeks of the school's opening, some kid came down with a contagious disease. They shuttered her school. Her five-year-old daughter was riding her tricycle down the street. There was a wire sticking out from a fence, got caught in her vagina, and ripped her vagina apart. So I thought to myself, my God, with all those things happening in a short period of time, no wonder she's trembling and crying and that kind of thing. <clears throat> Whereupon, much to my surprise, Dreyka said, I want you to see a neurologist, and I want you to see the neurologist this afternoon. And I thought, what's that all about? Mm -hmm. And he sent her to see Loyal Davis, who was the chairman of neurosurgery at Northwestern University and is, or was also the father of Nancy Davis, now known as Nancy Reagan. And uh, she had a brain tumor. They operated on her the next morning. And I said to Drucker's, how did you know that? And he told me about the question. It has saved my life many a time. So just recently we saw a young man who was going to, who had quit his job and was going to go to law school. And as the time approached, he began to have panic reactions. And he went to see his internist and his internist said, you better get yourself some psychotherapy because you shouldn't be having panic attacks just because you're starting law school. So he came to see us and we asked him the question and he came up with some answer that indicated that, was, that uh, his symptoms were not psychological. So I said, I would like you to see a cardiologist because I think you have a mitral valve prolapse. So he went to see a cardiologist who said, you're a living volcano. You have something far worse than the mitral valve prolapse that Dr. Mozak thought you might have. And uh, if you explode, you'll die. So we better take some aggressive treatment so that that doesn't happen. But if I did not have the question as a resource, I might have treated him for psychological panic attacks and he would have died on me. 
So it is an important technique. One of the funniest, except it's not so funny, I saw, I was doing a lifestyle with a patient of one of my colleagues, and as he read the material, something triggered something, and I said to her, you have headaches, don't you? And she said, every day of my life. And, well, do I proceed to treat her for headaches? After all, there was Gershwin. And he got treated for headaches too. Or do I check it out? So I asked her the question. I don't remember her answer anymore, but it told me that she had a non-psychological condition. She was also schizophrenic, unfortunately for her. Not only that she was schizophrenic, but schizophrenics do not get treatment. Ah, they're nuts. Why bother with them? So she went to see her internist who gave her that kind of treatment and said, you need psychotherapy. Uh, she said, I am in psychotherapy with Dr. Mozak. Good therapist, you'll do well with him, etc. So she came back and she had her headaches some more. So I decided maybe we'll send her to somebody who doesn't know her. So I sent her to a neurologist, and the neurologist took one look at her and said she's schizophrenic to himself, and uh, decided to slough her off too. We told her she ought to be in psychotherapy, so she came back and she saw me. After all, she was a compliant patient. And I was reluctant to treat her psychologically, except for her schizophrenia. But I wasn't going to touch the headache, but I wasn't going to let her die either. So. She decided, without discussing it with me, to come up here to the Mayo Clinic. They did an MMPI on her, and they said, gee, she's schizophrenic. <laughs> and she ought to be in psychotherapy. <laughs> and I'm totally frustrated. She lashed out, and she said, I am in psychotherapy, but it isn't getting rid of my headaches. So I got a report that she was a recalcitrant patient. <laughs> so she came back from her uh, from here and she said, Dr. Mosak, can you be, how can you be so sure when all the medical people say it is not medical? And I said, I'll bet my life on it that it's not medical. <coughs> so she said, okay, I trust you. What do I do? I said, I don't know. And then it occurred to me, I had studied headache with a headache specialist in New York City. And he came up every January to the uh, American Dental Association convention in Chicago. So I called him in New York and I said, uh, are you coming to the convention? He said, yes. I said, will you do me a favor? I have a patient with headaches and nobody can tell me what they're all about. Would you see her while you're here? And he said, sure. Have her up in my hotel room at two o'clock on Saturday and I'll take a look at her. And I said, there's something I have to tell you. She's schizophrenic. Don't pay any attention to it. I'll deal with the schizophrenia. All I want you to do is tell me why she has these headaches. So Saturday came and she got up to his hotel room through another entrance and where I was waiting. So the PA system screamed out, Dr. Mozak, would you please go up to room, etc. So she was up there with him maybe five minutes before I got up to the room. And I got up there and we greeted each other. And he said, why do you send me such easy cases? I said, easy? 
She's even foiled the Mayo Clinic. He says, that's because everybody is busy examining her. Nobody has taken a look at her. And he said to her, please stand up against the wall. And she stood up against the wall. And he said to me, OK, Harold, what do you see? And I knew what he was looking for because he was my teacher in headache. I said, well, her shoulders sloped this way. Her breasts sloped this way. Her hips sloped this way. I said, pull up your slacks. He said, don't bother. I can assure you her knees sloped that way too. He said, good, you got a diagnosis. What would be your solution to it? I said, well, it would seem to be a simple solution. Put a quarter inch heel pad in the low side, tilt her straight, it will relieve the muscles in her neck. And I suspect that ought to take care of her headaches on the basis of what you taught me. He says, of course. And anybody who looked at her would know that. But medical people are so, and he was one, are so busy examining and doing tests and using technology and all kinds of, they don't even bother to take a look at their patients. And then she threw them a bombshell. She said, I do have a heel pad in my shoe. Uh-huh. <laughs> he said, take off your shoes. She had it in the wrong one, so she was exacerbating the goodness. <laughs> so he told her to put the heel pad on the other side, and she went, oh, that feels so good. <laughs> and never had another headache. Oh, my God. And that's why I say it's not a matter anymore. I changed my mind between psychological and somatic. It's psychological and non-psychological. It doesn't necessarily have to be somatic, I discovered. So I find the use of this differential diagnosis question extremely valuable. Uh, I've even discovered things that I don't know anything about. <laughs> And the nice thing for psychologists is that you don't have to know anything about them because you're not going to treat them anyways. What you have to be is alert to the possibility that there's something non-psychological going on. So one of the first times I ever used the technique, a woman came in and she was dressed as women were dressed at the time. Hat gloves and all of that kind of thing. And she had been sent by an internist in Kansas or Nebraska or something like that because she was going to get married and suddenly she had feelings that she was going to drop to the ground, faint or whatever. So she changed jobs and came to Chicago and somehow or other she found drivers to me. And uh, she told me about her impending marriage, and yes, she did have some doubts about it, that kind of thing. And I said, well, you'll come back next week and we'll do your lifestyle, and I explained about the lifestyle. And when she got out of her chair, her gloves were in her lap, and as she stood up, they fell to the ground. And she bent over to pick them up and fell flat on her face. So, picked her up and got her on the couch, and I asked her the question. And it was at that time obvious to me that it was somatic. So she didn't have a doctor in Chicago, so I recommended an internist I knew, who at that time they hospitalized patients for tests. And uh, he called me back in about three days or four days and said, <coughs> I've given her the once over and I can't find anything. It sounds like she's one of yours. <laughs> I said, I think you're mistaken. I think she has some kind of physiological condition, etc. 
He said, well, which? I said, I'm a psychologist. I don't know about these <laughs> things. But I feel fairly confident that if you continue to look, you will find that she has uh, a somatic condition. So he said, okay, I'll run some exotic tests on her. And he called me back in a few days and he said, Harold, how did you know that she had von Recklinghausen's disease? And I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'd never heard of it. But it was an old name for a condition that I did know by its new name, multiple neuroma, where the person has bumps in various places. And she had one in the nerve in her ear. And it was damaging her balance. She was afraid constantly she was going to fall to the ground and did fall to the ground in my office. And unfortunately, von Recklinghausen's disease was totally lethal. She was going to die. But at least she wasn't going to be a healthy corpse. I wasn't going to spend all my time and hers treating her for something that she didn't have and not treating, getting her treatment for something she did have. I did learn from the newspapers within the month that they had found a way of maintaining patients with von Recklinghausen's disease, although the cure at that time still eluded them. So there are all kinds of ways in which this technique can be useful to you. And it's an easily learnable technique. Another differential <coughs> diagnostic technique is the serial seven subtraction test. Now, you may not believe <laughs> this either, but I was trained in an era <coughs> where there were almost there were almost no psychological tests. The Rorschach was still in Europe, where only a handful of people used it. The TAT was an experimental test at Harvard University. About the only, at the Wetzler, uh, at that time, Bellevue test, uh, had not yet been invented. And uh, we had precious little to use in terms of testing. So every clinician had his favorite little tactics which he invented, and they seemed to work. So they published, hey, I tried this, and it works. <coughs> and the serial seven subtraction test was one of them. The serial seven subtraction test is rather simple to administer, and it's nice because you can administer it in five minutes generally, and you don't have to do extensive neuropsychological testing for screening. The instructions are like this. I would like you to start with 100, take away seven from that and seven from that, all the way down. Now here, I have to caution you people, especially those people who have that inferiority feeling called, I never was good in math. <laughs> Do not state in the instruction all the way down to zero. It doesn't go down to zero. So if you give them that instruction, you may confuse your patients who think they fail the test because uh, they came up with the answer based on your instruction when they actually passed it. So their final answer is two, not zero. And they think that, gee, well, I was instructed to take it down to zero, so I must have gotten it wrong somewhere. So it's all the way down, skip, down to zero. And I administer the test three times. I give them three runs.
for one reason, I want to see it's a fluke, if it's a fluke. And then if you give them one run, it could be a fluke. And, you know, it's the kind of thing you do when you uh, try to uh, work on your checkbook. You lose a penny somewhere and you can't find it for the next three hours. <laughs> it doesn't make you a bad mathematician, but it's the kind of thing that, that happens to people. So that's one reason I give three runs. But in addition to that, I want to see whether the person improves on subsequent runs or deteriorates and gets even worse. Because if, it's, if it improves, I may wait a while before I make the decision to send them to a neurologist. If it gets worse, if it deteriorates, they get an immediate invitation to see a neurologist. So let me show you the kinds of things that will happen. One of them is they'll get it right. And uh, if they get it right three times, and especially if they do it rapidly, you can feel fairly confident that there isn't anything uh, obviously neurological involved. But then, <clears throat> there is the type one error. A hundred, ninety three, eighty five, etc. The person misses by one, and it can be either way, one short or one over. And I call that the checkbook error. You can do that because people do that. You can do that because you are anxious about what the test is all about. <clears throat> Why are they making me go through this? They're looking for something, I don't know what. They may do this if they have one of the anxiety disorders. And in their anxiety, they slip up. So this one is not a terribly significant uh, error unless the person is going to college and is going to major in physics. <laughs> <laughs> And if he does this thing, a spaceship may go out into space rather than orbit. So uh, there are some contexts in which this is important, but mostly it is not. It may alert you to another problem, and that's the one that I just came up with. And that is, uh, I never was good at math. And for some reason or another, the person may have to undergo some work with you about eliminating that I never was good at math feeling so that the person can operate a bit better. Then there is the type two error. And the type two error goes like this, 100, 93, 86, 76, 66, 56, <laughs> etc. Well, this kind of thing, for those of you who like labels, is called perseveration. And perseveration is often found in some schizophrenics 
and in some people with neurological disorder. In fact, uh, how many of you have taken a course of Rorschach? Okay, so you won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> some psychiatrist who's a Rorschach expert, his name was Piotrowski, came up with 10 signs for determining organic disorder. And one of them was perseveration. So this one says it's worth exploring a bit more to see whether the person is neurologically affected. The type 3 error <coughs> like this, a hundred, ninety-three, eighty-six, eighty-nine, mm -hmm. and then may continue down correctly, eighty-two, and mm -hmm. etc. But this is the only significant error. Now you can't subtract and get a difference which is larger than what you subtracted from. So obviously, if you take away 7 from 86, you can't get 89 except this person who can. Now, the 9 is correct. It's just the 8 which is not. If a person does that, I seriously consider sending him to a neurologist, especially if he does it in all three runs, or even does it a couple of times in a subsequent run or something like that. And I generally lean in term towards uh, some neurological investigation. And then there is the type four. see how I can explain this. Well, supposing you have a defective calculator. You don't know it's defective, but it is. And you now have to do <coughs> this problem. subtract 2 from 5. So what you do is you punch in 5, you punch in a minus sign, and you punch in a 2. And then you hit something that says perform the operation, namely subtract. Now at the moment you do that, the defect in the calculator manifest itself. It goes awry. What answer would you get? No, you will not get three. If it's defective, it'll be an accident if you get three. So by and large, it won't be three. Could get what seven. Would you get? Could get ten. Seven. 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 Could get two point five. You get almost anything but three. <laughs> <laughs> so here, a hundred, eighty-two, fifty-nine, zero. When you get that, the person ought to head to a neurologist, don't pass go, don't collect $200, etc. So these are the four kinds of answers you get. And of course, 
uh, even this one can get worse. On a second run, you may get. Or this may be the total run, 123, or whatever number. So if you get that, the person ought to be referred for neurological investigation. So those are two differential diagnosis techniques. Anything you want to ask about them before we proceed to another family of techniques? Yes? Did you ever send anyone to a math teacher? <laughs> I'm sorry? Did you ever send anyone to a math teacher? To a math teacher? Yeah, that they were so bad with math. Well, they will not manifest it on this, generally, because they may get an invitation not to be a math teacher. Mm -hmm. They might have to blow their whole career if they fail it. So, they may be lousy in math, but at most they'll come up with a checkbook error. Yes? Dr. Miller, uh, do you have the patient just verbally tell you the answer? Do you have them actually write it down? No, I don't have them write it down. Because, do you know anything about aphasia? Yes. Aphasia is a neurological condition which manifests itself in a million ways. And it can be sensory aphasia, and it can be motor aphasia. And uh, for one thing, you may not be able to understand speech at all. For another, you may be able to write something, but you can't read whatever you've written. Uh, or uh, you can name it, but not tell the use. Or you can tell the use, but you can't give the name. Uh, some years ago, a social worker came to see me. And it was just before the Memorial Day weekend, or. July 4th weekend, something like that, and she was going home in, to Nebraska for uh, the weekend. And she was a social worker and a damn good one. So much so that her agency kept prevailing upon her to become chief social worker, and she didn't want to be chief social worker. But uh, after rejecting the position several times, they finally got her to agree. So she uh, now met with her staff for the first time. And she said, you know how nervous I was? I trembled. I couldn't speak for a moment. Lights flashed in front of my eyes, and that in itself told me that she might have something neurological, because in many neurological conditions there is an aura. So before an epileptic has a grand mal seizure, very often he sees a light or lights in front of his eyes, etc. So I felt we ought to check that out. And I said, tomorrow morning, before you leave town, I'd like you to see a neurologist. And she went to see a neurologist, and the neurologist examined her and uh, didn't find anything. He called me and he said, I think this is one of yours, Harold. <laughs> so I said, I don't think so. Send her back to my office now. 
she was leaving town in the evening. And then she came back to the office and I gave her the Rorschach test. And we got to card three and she held it up. <coughs> and she said, these are two cannibals standing over a, uh, a uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 et cetera. And I said, yes, I know, but I'm not sure you know. She said, give me a pencil. So I gave her a pencil. She wrote down cauldron, two cannibals standing over a cauldron, which is a rather common response to card three. And I said, can you read what you just wrote? She couldn't. So I said, when you get to Nebraska, I would like you to see a neurologist. And he phoned me. She had a tumor in Broca's area, which controls Broca's. speech and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there are people with aphasia, and consequently, mm -hmm. we do it orally, mm -hmm. because if they write it down, they might write it down very, very well. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to perhaps read what they wrote down, but mm -hmm. so that's why we do it orally. We don't give them pen or pencil or anything like that. Yes? Can you just tell me does the question technique, does that work very well with young children? I don't know. Um, it I know works with kids roughly at about age 10. Uh, because I've had uh, a few patients at that level where I wanted to make the determination and it worked well. I must also say it perhaps worked well because both were math stars. Mm -hmm. And when after the question I asked them to do the serial sevens of the fuck that if they were kids who were not math stars, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, I started out as a child psychologist, uh, but gave that up uh, after a few years because parents sent their kids upstairs and said, I'll meet you down in the lobby. Uh, I couldn't get to the parents, so I decided to work with adults. So I don't have enough experience with this with kids to really be able to give you an answer. <coughs> Anything else? Okay, let's move on to another family. Paradoxical techniques. <coughs> Paradoxical techniques have a long history and an even longer history in Adlerian psychology where it had a different name. The term paradoxical techniques is associated with Viktor Frankl. And Frankl, before he went to the concentration camp, was a member of the Adlerian group, so at least that time he identified himself as an Adlerian. In the paradoxical technique, says Frankl, and this is them, <coughs> We give the person practice in doing something that he's afraid of. So Frankl gives an example of a physician he treated who was socially uncomfortable. Today he would be diagnosed as, so, as a social phobic. And the doctor tells Frankl, I'm just going to give up social life. I ain't going to any parties anymore because I'm just 
totally uncomfortable. I'm nervous, I wish I wasn't there, and by the time I leave, I'm so dripping with per perspiration, I just, it's just not worth it. So Franklin counsels him and says, no, I don't want you to give up this kind of social thing. But when you get to the party, I want you to deliberately sweat five gallons worth. <laughs> and after you have uh, sweat <coughs> five gallons worth, then you're free to go home if you want. Well, of course, <clears throat> you can't deliberately sweat five gallons worth, you see. So by doing the opposite of what you would ordinarily do, you overcome it in a sense. Now, a psychiatrist and Adlerian by the name of Erwin Wexford came up with the same technique before Frankel did, and he called it anti-suggestion. And that's the name you will find if you read the Adlerian literature. You will not find, except in modern Adlerian literature, any reference to paradoxical intention. And uh, anti-suggestion is a poor name. It smacks of hypnosis and that kind of thing. That's why Adlerians have dropped it use the name that Frankl came up with. And Wexford pointed out something like this. Never fight your symptoms. Because if you will fight your symptoms, you will exacerbate them. And he suggested if you have a symptom, have your symptom. Don't fight it. And as an example, I give, supposing you're on a ship and you're seasick. Now, it wants to come up. Now, if you fight it, what you'll do is you'll try to swallow it down. Now, in swallowing it down, you have to use more pressure than the pressure of it coming up. Otherwise, it'll come up. So you have to exert more pressure than the initial pressure to come up. Now, when you get it down, you're still nauseated, and it wants to come up. Now it has to come up with more pressure than you pushed it down with. And of course, when it comes up, you've got to push it down with even more pressure, which means that it wants to come up with even more pressure. And pretty soon, you don't care whether you live or die because you're that uncomfortable. So Wexberg said, never fight yourself. <coughs> it will only make it worse. If it's there, let it be there, do something else, uh, whatever, but don't fight your symptom. But there's another kind of paradoxical technique that few people speak about. And that is the therapist doing something paradoxical. He does something which you, for whatever reason you have, have come not to expect from a therapist. And there is a group of psychotherapists across the country who identify themselves as crazy therapists. <coughs> That's a formal name. And they do things 
that are quote crazy. The person who came up with this idea, the name, describes he had a patient who was critical of everything people did and was therefore critical of him too. And there was only one person in the world who consistently did the right thing. Everybody else had to be put down and criticized and all of that kind of stuff. So she came in to, for her appointment and uh, he didn't seem to be in the room. So she said, Dr. So-and-so, here. Where? Here. I don't see you. Well, look under the desk. So she looked under the desk and there he was. In the <laughs> space between the two sides of his desk. She said, Dr. So-and-so, what are you doing down there? He says, you're so busy putting me down, I thought I'd give you a head start. <laughs> <laughs> So crazy therapists do that kind of thing. They behave in a way, paradoxically, to something you might expect of a therapist. <laughs> uh, sometimes it seems nutty, but it makes the point. <coughs> so these are two kinds of paradoxical things. Now here, Adler was a leader, and he didn't know it. He just described it as an illustration. But when he started practice, there was a common symptom in Vienna, and that was fear of syphilis. So men would come in and say, I think I have syphilis. Now, when they came in this way, the physicians would try to let them know, unless they had syphilis, that they didn't have syphilis, that it was unnecessary to worry and all of that kind of thing. So the discussion went, uh, I don't think you have syphilis. And the patient would say, well, uh, uh, I had uh, intercourse with a prostitute. Well, not all prostitutes in Vienna are infected, etc. You probably don't. If any prostitute in Vienna had syphilis, this one probably did. And uh, the doctor could not reassure the patient. And after a while, the patient would decide, well, I'll find another doctor who knows his business and can readily see that I'm syphilitic. But when they came to Adler, Adler behaved paradoxically. So when the patient said, I think I have syphilis, Adler would say, boy, there's a lot of that going around in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what makes you think uh, you have syphilis? Uh, well, uh, I have uh, intercourse with a prostitute. Boy, do you know what the rate of syphilis in <laughs> prostitutes is? In the end? <laughs> and finally, Adler would upset the patient so much the patient would say, "I don't care what you say. I don't have it." <laughs> so Adler would say to him, "Okay, I'll take your word for it." <laughs> That would be the end of it. Now, Adler did not give that as a method. It's just a little technique he used with people who came in with this. And there's a large literature on the fear of syphilis because at that time, before they had medication for syphilis and that kind of thing, it was very, very common among males in Europe. So it is not only that we get the patient to operate paradoxically many times, the therapist behaves paradoxically. 
anything you want to ask about paradoxical techniques. Oh, I'm sorry. What symptoms are taken? Well, there I would not generally use this kind of technique because it is more than just getting past this point which is the point of a tactic. There you have to have strategies, and Edlerians have strategies for treating anorexia nervosa. In fact, they were one of the first people to do so. If you look in the British Edlerian Journal, you'll find probably the only reference at that time to anorexia nervosa. It's a rather primitive approach, but it was the start of an approach. So generally, we do not ask them to do this kind of thing. There, there are some other kinds of people where we do not use this with. We generally don't do it with obsessive compulsives. We treat them strategically rather than Let me add to that uh, question because it's a much broader question. You see, there are certain rules for using tactics. And if you don't observe them, you'll be in trouble. A teacher at the high school of my community went to one of these uh, touchy-feely uh, <laughs> seminars uh, somewhere and learned a few techniques and uh, uh, decided uh, that they were wonderful techniques as described by the presenter and uh, used the technique on one of the students that uh, he had in the high school but the student was schizophrenic and uh, he, use of these techniques uh, precipitated a schizophrenic crisis. They had to hospitalize uh, the student, the teacher, who didn't know much about psychology in the first place, but had learned, you know, 10 useful techniques at the seminar, uh, was dismissed from the teaching position and that kind of thing. So let me just uh, deviate from, I was going to talk about another family, and give you some of the uh, uh, Mozak's rules of therapy. <clears throat> the first is you will survive. <laughs> <laughs> except for these extreme conditions that I talked about last night where a therapist gets killed or something. By and large, you're going to live to see more patients. So even if you do something which turns out to be wrong, <coughs> I don't know a therapist who hasn't done things that are wrong. They don't work. Non-utilitarian. So you're going to survive, and that's an important lesson because it will relieve you of much. Well, 
anxiety. I discovered this myself when I was asked to appear on a panel on a Saturday morning at the hospital. And I didn't really want to do it. But they said, we're, having th we're bringing in three stars, and we need an Adlerian who can hold his own against these three non Adlerian stars. So finally I said, OK, I'll do it. And they were happy that uh, I would do it. And uh, they said, the nice thing about this is that the four of you will ad lib. There are no prepared presentation. You don't have to write anything out. You don't have to prepare. Uh, whatever comes up in the discussion comes up, and you can handle it. I said, fine. <clears throat> On the Thursday before the Saturday, the chairman of the conference called me and said, you're on the Saturday, you know. And uh, we haven't received a copy of your paper. <laughs> <laughs> so the copy of my paper, you told me that this was going to be ad lib. He said, oh my God, I did. And he was aghast. He said, what are you going to do, Harold? And he said, I really don't know. One thing I'm not going to do is prepare. And the second thing I know is that at 12 o'clock on Saturday, I will have survived whatever else happens. So. I spare myself anxiety. As a therapist, too, I know it'll work, it won't work, etc. But whatever else happens, I'll live to do it another day. The second rule is your patient will probably survive, too. <laughs> now, this is paradoxical. Because the feeling you get is if you say the wrong thing or you do the wrong thing, your patient will regress, commit suicide, kill somebody. Uh, who knows what terrible things will happen to or will happen not only to the patient, but to, in the patient's world. You know, we might kill somebody. I don't worry about that. I do what I think I need to do about the situation. But my feeling is, if what I say was so potent in making <coughs> patients do negative things, how can the same voice is not so potent in getting the patient to do positive things? <laughs> Somehow or other, when I suggest positive things, they stall, they don't want to do it, they fight back, they resist, etc. But I only have potency for negative behavior. I don't have any potency for encouraging positive behavior. So my feeling is, do the best you can. Your patient may be uncomfortable, may be upset, but he'll live till the next interview. And you don't have to worry about that, too. A third thing is, know your patient. Because not every technique will work with every patient. I can get away saying some things to some patients that I could not possibly get away saying the same thing to another patient. <clears throat> Next, no tactic is a panacea. I don't know anything which works all the time in every context. It just doesn't work that way. And in addition to that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try this and that or the other. And that was taught to me by my Jiu-Jitsu teacher in the Army in World War II. On the first day, he put us all in a circle in the gym. And he said, I'm going to teach you how to stay alive. 
in World War II. That seemed an appropriate goal. <laughs> and this man was a mere wisp of a man, 125 pounds or something like that. And he walked over uh, to the biggest person in the group and said, what's your name? And gave him his name. He said, hi. And the fellow made the mistake of extending his hand, too, and bounced off the back wall. <laughs> And we all looked and said, teach us that. And he said, no, that's for later. What I'm going to teach you is how to stay alive. So if a person puts a hold on you, you have to stay in motion. Bite him. Stamp on his toes. Try to kick him in the crotch. Keep moving, struggle, use your elbows. Because if you stop moving, you're dead. And a lot of therapists are dead as therapists because they stop moving. They try the one thing they know, and if it doesn't work, they have nothing else in their armamentarium to use. And it never occurs to them that merely being the operator of somebody else's techniques is not a sufficient role for a therapist. You can also be a creator of techniques. So if your elbows don't work, maybe your teeth will work. So. I don't always know what to do in therapy. But one thing I know is that there is always something to be done or that can be done. And consequently, I focus on finding that thing which can be done rather than feeling, gee, ain't it terrible? I tried it and it didn't work. Now what do I do? You can always be creative. So another rule of therapy is, if you want to stay alive, you must stay in motion. Another is, you must know your theory, whatever theory it might be. Because if not, you may do things which violate your theory. I always wince when one of my students says to a patient he or she is working with, do you know what the cause of that is? Well, Adlerians frown on the concept of causality. It's not a legitimate question for an Adlerian. It's a legitimate question for other therapists, but not for an Adlerian. Next, never play the patient's game. You may use it in demonstration, saying, in Eric Burns' terms, this is the game you want to play in therapy. But we never play the game. And if you don't learn it the easy way, you're going to learn it the hard way. Remember this. At his game, the patient is a pro. He's been playing it his whole life. Unless you are psychologically built like your patient, in which case you probably should not be doing psychotherapy. <laughs> you are an amateur at his game. And when an amateur and a pro get involved in a game, guess who is most likely to win? So do not accept 
the patient's invitations to play his game. Next, develop your own style. Don't ape your instructors, your supervisors, etc. Because what I can do you can't do, and that has nothing to do with experience, uh, that kind of thing. And what you can do, I can't do. Because I'm me and you're you. And you're accustomed to behaving in a certain style. I'm accustomed to behaving in my style. And if you try to ape me or any other instructor or supervisor or whatever, it won't generally come off. Because that's not you. Now, my students are aware that I use a lot of humor in psychotherapy. And they say, gee, you use so much humor and I can't tell a single joke. I forget punchlines. I have no delivery. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no reason to use humor just because I use humor. I can use it because I'm comfortable using it. And for people who are not comfortable, it won't come off. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a story. You'll like it at person prison. A new prisoner comes to the penitentiary and uh, he's now at his first evening meal. And uh, as he is sitting there eating his food, somebody yells out, 38, and there are gales of laughter. And somebody yells out, 75, and more laughter. And the new prisoner says, what's going on here? What's with all this number calling? He said, well, the prison library, the fellow next to him says, the prison library only has one joke book, and all the jokes are numbered. Everybody's been here so long, everybody knows all the jokes. If you want to tell a joke, you don't have to tell the whole joke. All you have to do is call out the number, and everybody knows what the joke is. Well, he wanted to be one of the boys, so right after dinner, he went to the library, and he got out the joke book and he memorized a few jokes and he was ready for breakfast the following morning. And the following morning, the breakfast came, somebody yelled out, 48, much laughter. Somebody yelled out, 83, again, much laughter. And the new prisoner yelled out, 19, and there was dead silence. And he turned to the fellow next to him and he says, how come nobody laughed? After all, I thought 19 was a good joke. He says, yeah, some people know how to tell a joke and some don't. <laughs> so, some people can do it. Role play. If you're good at it, do it. If you're not good at it, there are plenty of ways of reaching a person without doing role play. If you're good with humor, use humor. If you're not, there's still plenty of things you can do that have nothing to do with humor. You see? So you don't have to be an expert at everything. And just because somebody thinks it's a great idea, and even you think it's a great idea when you see the person do it, actually, it doesn't mean that you can do it. And that's no reason for inferiority feelings. It just means you're not the perfect specimen. Well, 
There's just one more I jotted down as an afterthought sometime. And that is, ignore all the rules that I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't mean completely. But it means that there are certain situations which run outside the kinds of things that you do or expect. On occasion, I will play the patient's game. For example, I ask the patient a question. I don't know. I ask him another question. I don't know. And in one way or another, he resists because he doesn't know anything. I say, well, I guess you're leaving it to me to know. So ask me any question you want to ask me. And the patient comes up with a question to which I respond, I don't know. <laughs> So I demonstrate the game to him by playing it with him. So that's why I say, forget the rules. They're not ironclad. <clears throat> OK, let's uh, get to another family. Sorry? Could we take a break? Why not? Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's keep it short. Uh, be back at 5 to 11. <clears throat> Snuffy. Snuffy Smith. You're one of the people who's too young to remember. <laughs> he was the comic strip below Barney Google. Okay, uh, coming back from the rules of therapy where I uh, moved with respect to paradoxical techniques. There are patients who will come in and, oh, this is terrible and this is terrible and my whole life has been terrible, etc. And they want to persuade me to be sympathetic to their plight or at least to believe that the cause lies in the past, et cetera, that kind of thing. And usually after they give me this kind of litany of disasters and that kind of thing, my usual response is, when do we come to the bad part? For those people, especially students, who want to impress me with, I failed at this, whatever it is, and now it's the end of my career, end of my life, my parents are so disappointed in me, and uh, gee, I blew my last chance, and stuff like that. My response is yes. Einstein might have been a great success if he hadn't failed math. <laughs> a woman came in to see me about her child who was six years old and gotten a report from, that he had to spend another semester in kindergarten because he was immature. And I asked her, what did she feel was so terrible about that? And she said, well, if he failed kindergarten, he'll never get into Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, why is that so important to you? And she responded with, Dr. Mozak, 
I have completely <coughs> ruined my child. And my response was, quit bragging. <laughs> there are other forces in the world, other influences, and maybe even the educational authorities were wrong in keeping him for another semester. But anybody who claims that they have completely ruined their child is bragging that I'm the only important influence in my child's development. Uh, Adler tells a story of a patient who attacked him and broke a window or something with glass and then expected Adler to retaliate in some way. You know, you can no longer be my patient or some such thing like that. And Adler said, I got up the bandages and I bandaged his hand, etc. And then I hired him as my gardener. And that refers even to what I spoke about last night, caring. <coughs> a young college student who was a perfectionist and felt that she had to get all A pluses uh, dropped out of college because it was obvious she wasn't going to get all A pluses. And her motive in coming to see me was put me in a mental hospital. <coughs> because if she was in a mental hospital, she'd have an excuse for her poor performance as she saw it. And there would be no pressure on her to do anything because after all, she was a mental patient. So one afternoon she called me and she said, Oh, Dr. Mozak, I am so terrible. I took all the bedding in my room and I tore it apart and I spread the feathers around. And then I broke a window and then I tried some dishes. Now will you put me in the hospital? And I said, No, I will not put you in the hospital. I'll put you in the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> After that, she became a patient. And then, there is a paradoxical technique I've devised, which I use with individual patients but I also use in marital counseling. Some people come into therapy and they want to regale you with what bad people they are, incompetent people they are, or some such thing like that. And they want to present a totally negative picture of themselves to you. And sometimes it's accompanied with, I've seen six therapists already, and none of them has been able to help me. You know how that gets translated into English? I dare you. I've beaten six, and you're going to be the seventh. I call these people scalp collectors. <laughs> so paradoxically, I ask them, I would like you to tell me 10 nice, positive things about you. And they don't expect that kind of thing. They're not prepared. If you ask them for 10 negative things about themselves, oh, they'll rattle them off. Mm -hmm. But they're not accustomed to thinking nice thoughts about themselves. So they delay, they stall. There's nothing nice about me. Uh, gee, this is hard. Uh, I'm not accustomed to thinking that way, and all kinds of baloney like that. 
and I stick up a thumb and I say, okay, number one. And they may or may not struggle with it, but they come up with one. And as they call off subsequent ones, I hold up fingers until we get to 10. You can imagine with these patients, it takes a long time to come up with 10. And when they finish, there's a big sigh of relief. Thank God that's over. I'm off the hook. I don't have to do hard things like that anymore, etc. Or don't ask me to do hard things like that anymore. And I tell them, wait, we're not through yet. Supposing I were to tell you, I knew a person who, and I list the 10 that the person has given me. What would you think or what would you say about such a person? And then I realize that they've been let into a trap. <laughs> and eventually they say, well, I'd have to say that he's, they say something positive good person, a decent person, somebody I would like to know, uh, etc. And I used to stop there and we talk about being a nice person and why the person resists labeling himself as a nice person and all of that kind of stuff. But I'm action oriented. I feel people can talk a good game, but it's pretty difficult to <clears throat> live a good game. So I added on to it. I now tell my patients for these many years, when you leave here, I would like you to stop in a drugstore, stationery store, and buy yourself a cheap little notebook. And every day, I would like you to record one nice, positive thing about yourself. Well, some patients are resistant to that. Some say, well, if you think I ought to do it, I'll do it. I don't know why, but I'll do it. Some say, OK, I'll do it. And I say, well, I'm glad to have your consent. <laughs> But it is customary in our field that if you ask the patient to do something which is dangerous, you can't settle for consent. You must have informed consent, which means that I have to explain the dangers to you, and only then if you consent are you obliged to do it. Well, now they're intrigued. What can be so dangerous writing down? One nice thing about myself every day, it may be that I may not be able to do it or that kind of thing, but what's so dangerous? And I explain to them what's so dangerous. I say, one year from today, how many nice things are you going to have in that notebook? And depending on the year, they say 365 or 366. And then I say to them, and when you get to 365, how will you be able to sustain the notion that you're inadequate, that you're not, that you're a bad person, or, or whatever? And again, they realize that they've walked into a trap. And I collect homework. Always, if you assign homework, and I'm a homework assigner, make sure you collect it. So every week when they come in, I ask to see what they've written. It sometimes gives us something to talk about. You say this nice positive thing about yourself. Has it ever occurred to you that you could use that for vocation? So always collect the homework. So these are some examples of paradoxical tactics that I used and still do use with patients. 
Then there is a family called Placing in Perspective. The CBT people call this reframing. So sometimes a person comes in with trepidation about something he has to do or feels he has to do, etc. And I ask them, what's the worst thing that can happen? And they may tell me what they see is something terrible happening, the worst. And I ask them, after that, after they've told me the worst thing, if that should happen, would you be able to survive? Now, if you can survive the worst thing, you can survive anything which ain't that bad. So then we can talk about the things, the disasters that can occur because he'll be able to, with at least help, get through any of these disasters that he makes. An Adlerian by the name of Alexander Neuer, N-E-U-E-R, would ask his patients a similar question. This thing that you fear, this disaster or whatever, what would, a, what would a little bird sitting on your tombstone 10 years after you're dead think about the situation? And usually the patient answers in terms of the way it's framed. A little bird 10 years after I died would not think very, very much about it. Or for that matter, not at all. Consequently, it's only important right now. It's not something that for eternity people will be talking about, etc. And people talking about it for eternity is a very, very common fear. I'll goof and they'll never let me live it down, etc. By golly, if I ever did that, or if I ever did that and I failed, people would talk about it forever. And when I listen to all the stuff, they draw a breath, I say, by the way, what was the name of the captain of the Titanic? <laughs> well, everybody remembers the Titanic going down, but I feel fairly confident that not a single person in this room would remember. Is there anybody who remembers the name? No, his last name was Smith. His last name was Smith. Well, there's a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> but at least they could talk about how Captain Smith did whatever it is they feel he did. It. I only know because I looked it up. I wondered what was the name of the Captain of the Titanic. Other than that, I'd be like the rest of you in this room. It's not a matter of having superior knowledge. But the things that we fear most are generally things that ain't going to happen anyways. So people probably will not be talking about you and your misdeeds and that kind of thing for, until eternity. And uh, I do know the, there was a fella whom they talk about regularly in football season, who ran and scored a touchdown for the other team. I haven't the faintest idea what his name is. So, I can't even. Hmm? He was a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Marshall. If, if he was a Viking, they wouldn't be talking about him. No, he was on our home team, the Vikings. Yeah, I know, but they wouldn't be talking about him because the Vikings do that regularly. Oh. Oh.
we Chicago Bears fans. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, they won't be talking about you forever and the mistakes you make and how you've goofed it up and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a placing in perspective I use with compulsive people, especially compulsive housewives who seek therapy. And they tell me, at two o'clock in the morning, they're standing on a chair, wiping up the ceiling, because they may have guests the first thing in the morning, and they wouldn't want guests to come into a filthy house, etc. And they just put pressure on themselves, and uh, they like it because they do it, but at the same time, they don't like the fact that they have to do it. I wish I could get more rest, is a common complaint. And I say, well, I can understand. You'd like people, when they enter your house, to find a clean house. And I'm certainly sympathetic to that. But at the same time, the day after you die, there will be some left over. And you won't be around to do it. So when people come to express condolences to your family, they're going to see perhaps the ceiling not clean. <laughs> and you will not be able to do anything about it. So, do you want to persist in doing this until you, the, the day you die, and then let fate take over? Or maybe you might want to do it right now. See, And I've adopted that as my own philosophy. I have a good number of things, writing and teaching and my family and all kinds of stuff. And I console myself with the day I die, there's going to be some left over. I ain't going to be caught up on all the things that I want to do or I'm doing or whatever. It's just going to, ain't going to happen. So I do not pressure myself to do more and more and more and more and more and more. The only thing I decide is the day I die, since there's going to be some left over. What do I want to be left over? What do I want to do now while I'm still alive? And it takes the, that kind of pressure off of me. There is a tactic that I use with pleasers. The pleaser wants to please everybody, not just most people, but everybody. And consequently, they run into problems because first of all, you can be the nicest kind of pleaser in the world. You still aren't going to please everybody. And certainly you're not going to please everybody, <coughs> even the people you do please at all times. So it's a losing proposition right off. Yeah, you could accomplish it to please everybody. But in addition to that, you lose sight of your own identity. Because if I talk with you and ask your opinion, you will give me an opinion. And if I want to please you, then I will have to put pressure on myself to agree with you. But supposing she comes up with a contrary opinion to yours. Now I'm in a dilemma. If I please you, I displease her. If I please her, I displease you. And on that basis, it's a no-win situation. 
had to go through day after day after day and be in no-win situations is not a pleasant kind of life to lead. People feel like pleasers, feel like comedians. They have to turn colors depending uh, on whom they're talking to or whom they're engaged with. They can't really be themselves. And like many impersonators, pretty soon they don't know who they are because they don't dare express an opinion of their own because if they do, it's going to displease somebody. So it's a losing situation. But they want everybody to have nice, kindly, positive thoughts about them. And when I try to work this through with them, they come up with a general argument. What's wrong with pleasing? After all, they say to me, don't you like to please? And I have to admit, sure, I like to please. But I don't have to please. Because I recognize I ain't going to please everybody at all times. It just ain't going to happen. So I put pressure on myself to do the impossible. And that means I can still be pleasing. It doesn't sell them very often. So I've come up with a tactic. I asked the patient, do you believe in God? And most often they say yes. If they don't believe in God, I stay in motion and I do something else. <laughs> so they say they believe in God. And I say, this God that you believe in, does he please everybody? And they answer, of course not. They're atheists, for example. So obviously he doesn't please everybody. And even of the people he does please, does he please them all the time? Or when there's a tragedy, do they say, I don't think God's doing a great job because he permitted this earthquake or this plate to fall or, or whatever. And they agree that God doesn't please everybody, and he doesn't please everybody at all times. At which point I tell them, now here is God, who is the symbol of perfection. And for millennia, he's, trying to, he's been trying to please people and he hasn't succeeded in pleasing everybody and he hasn't succeeded even in, ple in pleasing everybody at all times and you imperfect as you are are going to succeed where god has failed mm -hmm. i found it to be a very very effective reframing technique. If that doesn't work, I tell them a fable, one of Aesop's, the miller, his son, and the donkey. Do you know that fable? There was a miller who was a pleaser. And he was going to town to barter two sacks of flour for whatever it was he needed. And his son saw him loading up the donkey. And asked if he could go along with his father to town. The father said, sure, hop on the donkey. And they tied the two sacks of flour to the donkey, and off they went. And they hadn't gone but a short distance when somebody came out to the road and said, ah, terrible. 
There's no reverence for one's elders anymore. Here, this young man sits up there like a prince, etc., and his older father has to walk along besides the doggy. So, father, being a pleaser, decided that didn't please somebody. He took the kid off the horse, off the donkey, and he got on the donkey himself. And the kid walked. And they hadn't gone but a further a short distance. And somebody came out to the side of the road and said, terrible, terrible, terrible. Here, this man rides big and strong, etc. His little kid barely has strong enough legs to trot along afterwards. And he doesn't see any injustice in this. And the miller thought, well, that makes a bit of sense. But he couldn't reverse anymore because he had done that and that had failed. So his next solution was to get his kid up on the donkey and the two of them rode the donkey and somebody came out to the side of the road and said, I'm going to report you to the SPCA. <laughs> After all, I realize a donkey is a beast of burden. Uh, but this is ridiculous. A man, a child, two sacks of flour, what are you trying to do? Kill the beast? And now, Lee Miller had run out of almost all of his solutions. So he got off, he took his son off, he took the two uh, sacks of flour off, and then he pushed the beast over the cliff because the beast was the, sort of all, uh, was the source of all trouble. He put the two sacks of flour on his shoulder and the two of them walked down. And Aesop's moral is, uh, basically, you cannot please everybody. My own moral is, anybody who tries to please everybody will wind up losing his ass. <laughs> So there are a bunch of these kinds of techniques. <laughs> if one doesn't work, then you try another one. <coughs> and as my Jews, it's a teacher. You may accidentally find one that works. <laughs> so those are some of the putting in perspective or reframing techniques. There are many others of which a creative therapist will use or create. Anything you want to ask about them? You have a wonderful teacher. He covers everything so well, there's nothing left to ask. <laughs> Next, there are confrontation techniques. This is one family of techniques which many people have difficulty with. They tell me, I can't confront, I'm not that kind of person. And many people stop themselves from using confrontation techniques because They have an erroneous notion of what a confrontation technique is. Uh, they feel like uh, Jackie Gleason, pow, right in the kisser. Uh, you know, that's what con confrontation entails. Confrontation can be very, very gentle. Some people would call some confrontation non-confrontational even. Now confrontation tactics or techniques are sometimes just like interpretation, except there's the element of challenge in it.
So when a person agrees with some advice, or you've talked about something and the patient says, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. Patients who uh, rely on this, consciously or unconsciously, are complying so that they don't have to move. It's a resistance through compliance. Sure, I'll do it, Doc. I'll have to get to it. I really will. And I add to their statement, how about starting this afternoon? That's the element of challenge. Ah, that's not a how right between the eyes kind of confrontation. But it says, in essence, I challenge you to put your money where your mouth is. Sometimes I point out body language. I may say to them, I must be getting close. I see the look of alarm in your eyes. Or, I, in multiple psychotherapy, saw a social worker's patient in my hospital. And the social worker wanted to do the lifestyle of the patient, and she had collected all the material. And I sat there listening to all the material and wondered whether she was going to get to the important material. And she didn't. Because here was the person sitting with a half dollar birthmark right there and never mentioned this. So I asked the patient about it, and she said, yes, it's a birthmark. And I've never done anything about it because it is not that important to me. But I know it's there because whenever I get upset, it gets larger. Now here it's giving the therapist a thermometer <laughs> Actually, <laughs> watch that birthmark. You'll know whether you're getting close. But that never came out in her collection because she had a form and she slavishly followed that form. And as my colleague in New York, my teacher in Headache said, she didn't look at her patient. She's busy filling out a form. So sometimes I will point out some body language. So just on Tuesday, I told a patient, we're going to have to talk about that next time more. She said, why? I thought we had covered that. And I said, the splotches on your neck tell me that you have not. So sometimes we point out, we confront them with their own body language. Another is we point out verbal language. Robin Gushurst and I wrote a paper many years ago called What Patients Say and What They Really Mean. I've made many patients stutter using this technique. You see, there are certain things that people say, we don't have to be patients, you've done it, I've done it, which means something different than it sounds like on the surface. So, somebody tells you about something you should do. Therapists do that quite often. 
and the patient said, you're right, I really should. Now, you think the patient should, and the patient thinks that he or she should. What more is there to talk about? Well, there's plenty more to talk about if you understand what I should really means. I should is half of a sentence. <clears throat> the other half of the sentence is, but I ain't gonna. <laughs> I never get up or say I should brush my teeth. There are only two times I should brush my teeth. One is when I got a broken arm and the other is when I got a broken tooth. Because I say I should brush my teeth, but in view of my limitations, it ain't going to happen. Other than that, I don't say I should. I stick my toothbrush in my mouth and away I go. So when a person says I should, he's expressing good intentions which he doesn't really have. another half sentence. And that is, but I don't think I will succeed. Anything I feel I will succeed at, I don't try, I do. And if you use I'll try, you're setting yourself up because when the ball comes out in left field and you have the expectation that you're not going to catch it, you very likely won't catch it. Another one that comes up in therapy, why do you do that? It's a habit. And, well, Everybody has habits, so the therapist, having habits himself, realizes that uh, this is not abnormal behavior. People do have habits, so they, if they have a habit, they keep doing it, and all of that kind of stuff. And while all of that may be true, the person who says it's a habit is actually telling you what his therapeutic behavior is going to be like. It's a habit means you ain't going to get me to change it. Now, I didn't know that, so I tried to help people correct their habits early on in my career. But I kept many in meeting the same kinds of responses for my patients over and over and over again until I set myself the task of understanding what the patient was really communicating to me. So I examined the behavior. They said it was a habit and they tried to get by with it's a habit. But then if I tried to get them to eliminate the habit or modify the habit, I got a second level of response. It's a bad habit. And everybody knows that bad habits are more intractable than just plain old habits. And if I press them further, as I did early in my career, to change, modify, eliminate the habit, I got a third level of defense. Can anybody guess what it is? Addiction? No. Addiction is another, has another meaning. It's related to the habit, but... It's the way I am. 
They do come up with that occasionally. But they will come up with, it's a really bad habit. And everybody knows that God himself can't yeah. help the patient to eliminate those kinds of really bad habits. Now, the one you used comes up and the person says, that's me, that's the way I am. Uh, you can't change human nature, you can't teach an uh, old dog new tricks. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, uh, versions of that. And do you know what that means? I'll be damned if I'll change. <laughs> that's the way I am and that's the way it's going to be. So on that basis, the patient is confronting you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I point out invitations and provocations because patients do all kinds of things to therapists. <coughs> that are non-therapeutic. So, one thing, they'll try to bore you to death. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I was conceived. <laughs> that they want to go through every day of their existence, etc. <laughs> you have other plans for therapy. Or they want to talk about trivia. It's such a nice spring day, Dr. Bozak. Let's talk about lilacs, the Chicago Cubs, the Chicago Symphony, uh, anything but therapy. And they'll ramble along Nothing but much therapeutic will come up. So I tell them, you know, I'm feeling pretty bored. Mm -hmm. Or it may be some other thing. I'm feeling pretty angry right now. And that tells the patient that I'm listening. I'm a human being and I respond with human feelings. Just because I'm a therapist doesn't mean that I eliminate all feelings. And then I say to them, is that what you're trying to get me to do? To be bored or be angry? They may even say yes. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, we have a mild confrontation. Sometimes we have a not so mild confrontation. I had a patient with Drikers who came from New York City and became our patient. And the first thing she did sitting down was take out a whiskey bottle and put it on the desk next to her. <laughs> and now she was ready to do therapy. <laughs> She insisted that she had seen nine therapists in New York and none of them had been able to help her. And uh, she wanted us to write all nine therapists. And we sent some of the therapists a note saying, if you have anything important, to tell us, would you? And one said, I will not, I would not have this drunken hulk frightening the patients in my waiting room. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Dreikers had a German accent which he never lost. She addressed him with, 
you are Dr. Dreikus, the great Dr. Dreikus. I'll call you you old fart. <laughs> Every second sentence was not an obscenity. <laughs> and uh, early on in therapy, she used this kind of thing. And uh, we didn't attend to that. We had more important things to attend to. Uh, we had to do something about her drinking, somehow or other respond to it. And we let her know that unlike certain of her other therapists, we would not get her out of jail if she persisted in getting in jail and some other standards we had for our therapy. But one hot June or July day, the office was very busy and I had to use an office with no windows and it was hot and sticky and I was feeling terribly great about the situation. And she came up with something outrageous. I forget what it was. And I didn't respond to it. So she invited me to respond to it. And she says, how do you feel about that, you prick? <laughs> And I said, you really want to know how I feel? And she said, yes. And I said, I think you're full of shit. <laughs> uh, you can hardly get a more extreme confrontation than that. But it was hot, and I was in temper, and I'm a human being. So she stood up and told me that I didn't need a partner to have sex with. <laughs> <laughs> and slammed the glass door on the way out. <laughs> and you know what my feeling was? Yeah, Good riddance. <laughs> but I didn't get that lucky an hour <laughs> She was on the phone to me. Are we still on for Thursday? <laughs> but that stopped all of that language. And uh, after that, we talked. So confrontation can be very mild or can be rather intense. Another thing we do in confrontation is point out alternatives. Seems to me you have your choice of doing A, doing B, or doing C. Which of those do you want to do, or which of those do you want to discuss? And sometimes they say, there's also D, E, and F. They come up with their own solutions that haven't occurred to me. And I challenge them to talk about career change if that's the issue. So we point out alternatives. And then we point out immediate behavior, which the patient may not be aware of. And the therapist in all of his discussion with patients, previous discussion, has not become aware of this particular thing, whatever it is. And every therapist has his devices of finding out these things. And sometimes there are things that just happen, they're unplanned. It's not a matter of the therapist, I got a technique, I'm going to use it right now. The therapist is doing something else. And quite accidentally, this happens. Now, 
I can give you an example of that. Many years ago, I had a patient, pretty woman, came into therapy because she was having some problems with her husband and decided I may have to divorce this guy. And if I have to divorce him, I'm going to have to support myself. So why not, in preparation, get myself a job and see what it's like to live a divorced life before I do it. You can tell it's many years ago because she was an excellent typist. She's a wonderful secretary. And before she got married, people paid her salaries that were substantially higher than secretaries got because she was really a pro. She was really good. But in this new career attempt, she got herself a job, and after one week, she quit because her employer made a pass. So on the spot, she said she wouldn't stand for that. She had no interest. She had enough problems being married and getting divorced. She didn't need a lover or anything, and she quit. She got another job, and the same thing happened after a week. So she quit and got herself another job, and there was no problem for her to get a job. She was a real, real first-class pro. So she lost or quit her third job in three weeks, basically. So we talked about, why is this happening? She says, I do nothing, nothing to invite them to come on to me. I am all business. I do my thing. I do it well, etc. But somehow or other, it seems that this is all men are interested in. And I said, I'm not sure that you're not contributing something, but you may not be aware of what you're contributing. And she said, why is that? I've never given you any reason to believe that I'm looking for this kind of encounter. And I said, well, it has nothing to do with you directly, but I once learned a Hungarian proverb. If one person calls you a horse, laugh it off. If two people call you a horse, give it serious thought. But if three people call you a horse, you better run out and get yourself a saddle. And here, three times, people have done this to you. So I have to believe that there's something going on that you and I are not aware of. Dr. Mosaic, I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. I said, let's do a little role play. I will be your boss. I'm here behind the desk. Uh, you've done a letter for me, let's say, and you're coming in uh, to, for me to sign it. So she steps out of my office, knocks on the door, I invite her in, and she says, uh, Dr. Mosaic, I have a letter for you to sign. And I'm sitting behind the desk. At that time, I used a desk. And instead of staying here on this side of the desk, she came around to right here and put the papers down in front of me. Now, one of the things she and I had talked about were her pendulous breasts, <laughs> which were a problem in itself. But in the Lana Turner period, her father manufactured cashmere sweaters. And he would send her to high school every day to drum up business. She'd wear a different sweater every day. And of course, the boys, seeing her with her pendulous breasts, made all kinds of problems for her. 
So here she is, and she leans over to put the papers down, and I say to her, stop one minute and take a look where you are, because her breasts were sitting on top of my head. <laughs> And she didn't know that unconsciously she was inviting her boss's behavior. And certainly nothing we had talked about gave me any clue that this is why she was losing jobs. So she learned to stay on this side of the desk. <coughs> and she kept her job. So sometimes we point out immediate behavior. Look what's going on right now. So, these are some confrontation techniques. Uh, Dr. Schulman has written two papers on confrontation techniques in my book on tactics and counseling and psychotherapy. I speak of more, and uh, you can look at those if you're interested in following up on confrontation techniques. Anything you want to know about confrontation techniques before we move on. To me, many, many people will want to debate you and get you in a debate. And how do you keep from getting caught in a, a debate with somebody? Or a patient that wants to debate with you, um, uh, uh, how, do you how do you get out of that debating position? Uh, well, there are many, many ways I get out of that uh, debating. Uh, and it depends how the patient presents it. You see, uh, I had one patient who uh, would tell me that Adlerian psychology wasn't much, that uh, so-and-so psychology was better. Uh, and uh, he'd say, well, uh, you may believe that, Dr. Mozak, but uh, uh, Fritz Perls wouldn't go for that kind of uh, statement or behavior or whatever. And, would counter everything, you see. And I couldn't get across to him that I was not interested in that particular process of therapy, making it a debating society. So I tried this and I tried that, and it didn't work. So he made a statement. And my response to that statement, whatever it was, was McKee and Poe wouldn't agree with that statement. Now, McKee and Pogue are a real estate firm right across the University of Chicago. <laughs> now, he didn't, he'd never heard of McKee and Pogue. So he didn't pursue that discussion. <laughs> but the following week when he came in, he said, I've been checking and remember this is pre-computer days. I can't find the psychology director or the psychiatry director. <laughs> the names of those people you mentioned last week. And I said, that's because they aren't psychologists or psychiatrists, they're real estate people. <laughs> but I wanted to let you know that if that was the game you wanted to play with me, et cetera, referring to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, mm -hmm. so you probably will get the same therapeutic results that I just got <laughs> having you look up McKee and Pogue. So I said, do you want to do that? because we can keep mentioning names and theories and all of that. 
My own feeling is we ought to talk about you. Well. He partially accepted it. At that moment, he later accepted it more. Uh, that was one technique I used. Others I merely say of the writing of books, there is no end. That's what King Solomon said. So on that basis, you'll always find somebody who says something, that kind of thing. But you'll also find people who say just the opposite. And I am not a debater, I'm a therapist. If you're looking for debate, join the University Debating <laughs> Society or whatever. I do therapy and nothing else. Um, there are ways of getting around that kind of thing. <laughs> and generally, with that kind of thing, you have to be confrontational. Dr. Mozak, I know that these folks would probably rather listen to you than have lunch, but... Uh, oh, it's that time? Well, you have a lunch engagement. So, uh, yes, I do. You lunch at one o'clock. Okay, we'll see you at one o'clock.